Hey everyone, this is John from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Welcome to episode seven of Guest Sets, our online series where we talk about influences. And right now I'm sitting here with Marissa, with Mike, and with Jarrett, better known as Screaming Females, who will be headlining our Summer in the City concert series tonight on our Rock Hall Live stage outside. That's a free show, so if you're nearby the area, come on down tonight, check it out. And you can check out rockhall.com for the full slate of uh, Rock Hall Live Summer Series. Um, but so uh, these guys put together an awesome list. We'll talk about it. It's available on Spotify, too. So if you want to follow the Rock Hall on Spotify, follow our Guest Sets Screaming Females playlist. We'll talk about the songs on the list and maybe just talk about your influences in general for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. But uh, for, all for all three of you, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I second that. Yeah, yeah. I like to start maybe at the beginning. So, Marissa, Mike, you guys actually go to high school together, right? Still. Still, yeah. Yeah, You're, we haven't graduated. So, yet. can you maybe talk about some of your earliest, your earliest influences? When we were in high school together, uh, we went to a thing on Wednesday afternoons Tuesday. called Tuesday afternoons <laughs> called <laughs> Music Club. Our math teacher would uh, show us videos of fish. <laughs> and um, make us play fish songs I and ween songs. Modesky, Martin, and Wood. Modesky, yeah. Martin, right. and Wood. Um, so that's where it all started. And that wasn't really your style, but, but you guys developed some sort of a kinship, yeah. clearly, right? But that also taught us how to improvise. That's yeah. true. So yeah. thank you, Fish. In retrospect, I'm very happy about it. At the time, I was furious. Marissa, you start playing guitar around 14, I think. Your your dad taught you some Nirvana songs, I yeah. think. is, mm -hmm. And so groups like Nirvana, Smashing Pumpkins, I think I read, Pearl Jam, that kind of was your, your maybe your, your earliest influences before you began to maybe broaden out. Is that accurate? Yeah, because my dad was still like, um, well, he still does. But he, he was, remember, um, who was that, like, subscription CD service? Columbia? Yeah, Columbia my dad House, had a yeah. Columbia Or <laughs> BMG was yeah, the other yeah, one. Yeah, either way. Yeah. But he would get like 10 CDs 10 a month. 10 CDs for a penny. It was awesome. It was the best. I think. I don't know. Uh, I didn't understand money yet. If but you uh, kept changing like your mailing address, you can keep getting the free 10, oh, 10 CDs it. for a penny. I, I found ways wow. around it. Oh, yeah. It now there's changed the name. Great. You're like, wow, my cat has <laughs> yeah, a CD. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, so he, and I guess all those bands had been gone for a while, even at that point, because yeah. it was the early 2000s. But he was still listening to them. And then once I became interested in um, rock and roll, he just, you know, I would just buy, steal them from him and, and listen to them. So he had guitar and he played just, he, he still plays just for funsies. Yeah. And uh, when I was in Nirvana, he was like, this song's easy, I could teach this to you. And then he did. And then eventually you're, you're, um, you begin to be introduced to new music. You're discovering Kill Rock Stars uh, and, and Riot Girl music. And it, was that sort of the moment may maybe when you thought about being a musician yourself? Was that connected in any way? For sure. I mean, I think um, when I first started playing guitar, I never really thought that I would ever, A, become good enough to be in a band, or B, um, be like accepted into the fold. Because like from what I understood from the music that I owned, uh, women weren't really like included often uh, in these like monolithic yeah. kind of yeah. rock bands like Pearl Jam and like Smashing Pumpkins and stuff. So even though there was a woman in my band. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, forget it. It'll never happen. And that really bummed me out. And yeah. then once um, I started listening to Slater Kinney and, and all the other kind of like, Kill. yeah, all the, yeah. Or all the Kill Rock Stars yeah. bands, um, I was like, oh, these people have had similar life experiences to me and are like all like skilled musicians. I can probably find people like that someday, I hope. Uh, Mike, you started, I think, on guitar, but maybe I think we're encouraged to switch to bass after working with Marissa. Is that right? Yeah, I wanted to play guitar, but Marissa was really good at it. <laughs> and so I thought, if I play bass, I get to play with her. What, a, a, what a treat. <laughs> and I think I read that, uh, like, Paul Simonon from The Clash was a big influence, yeah, especially played, early on. Yeah, right? played along to all of those yeah. albums. We had his smash guitar on display for years here. It was... <laughs> It was awesome. Where is it now? Um, you know, it, it, actually, it might still be in our punk case. Things are always coming and going. But we had a big Clash exhibit probably 10 years ago. 
Will you take us to the secret back punk room? We'll see if we still got it. And I'll definitely show it to you. Yeah. Can I touch it? Uh, if you wear the gloves okay. and you're with me, okay, cool. we can touch it. <laughs> um, Jared, I, I love you. Know, something you, I read you say once is that um, your favorite bands, and maybe this goes for all of you, they, they stand, and the ones that stand the test of time, they just do what they want to do. Um, that they don't kind of get boxed into a certain style. I think that really speaks to you guys' influences as a, as a whole. You've, I mean, you've opened for groups like Dinosaur Jr. and Garbage. Um, you've collaborated with producers like Steve Albini and Butch Vig. You know, these are super producers. You've covered everybody from like Neil Young to Sheryl Crow, which that in itself it shows just kind of in the breadth of, of where you're pulling music from. Uh, but you often get kind of compared to groups like Sleater Kinney, uh, Heavens to Betsy, Bratmobile, Pixies. With all that, um, I, I heard you once say that you you didn't want to ever get boxed into be like, this can't be a screaming female song. You kind of always stayed open. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that when we first started playing as a band, a lot of the, the shows that we were playing and the bands that we were playing with, a lot of punk bands, um, at the time, and I'm sure throughout different scenes throughout history, you feel like uh, you have to play a certain style yeah. to be kind of accepted into a community. And it's not so much that someone would come up to you and, and say, you're not punk because you're playing this song, but it's more like, what does it mean to be in, to be in a pop punk band if yeah. then you try to play some sort of ballad or something, yeah. you know? Um, so, but, uh, but I think that the, the, the kind of negative side of that comes in when you end up with people who they, they're like, I'm gonna start a band and it's gonna sound like this band mixed with this band yep. and anything that's not part of that equation is not allowed in to this project. And uh, we never started out saying anything like that. So I know that we have a lot of friends who play in really great bands and then, but the band will just sound the same for, you know, the first year, the second yep. year, the third, in 10 years in or something as bands still sound the same as when they started, it seems, it seems like that's more forced than a natural evolution or bringing in your other influences. So I think that it was something that we might not have even consciously done, but we consciously kept up, which is that there's no sound or element that is distinctly not something that could be a Screaming Female song. I imagine it gives you great freedom to, great artistic freedom to sort of never feel like there's any boundaries from which you need to play in. Right. Yeah, sure, and it 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 uh, allows. I mean, we're in our thirteenth year as a band, yeah. and we've recorded seven albums and a bunch of singles and stuff. And it just means that if somebody has an idea and brings in something different, you have something new to work with. Yeah, that's cool. Let's dive into the playlist. I think we got about ten songs or so, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Um, you open your your playlist with "Bug," kind of a great. It feels like a '90s alternative rock song, but it came out in 2017. The song is called "Whiskey in the Water." Who wants to maybe talk first about that particular song? Uh, yeah, they're they're a band from Bloomington, Indiana, and there's a, a really cool young punk scene that's been going on over the last five years or so, and a lot of the bands are kind of like real out there and weird, and uh, some of the people involved in this band were in, are involved in that scene, and then they suddenly came up with this band that's super melodic, super catchy, guitar hooks, and I thought it was really cool that, in the same way we were just talking about, that they didn't feel like they needed to be, uh, you know, penned in by their scene, yeah. and their scene really accepted it, and now they're doing well and touring a lot. Yeah, I definitely hear a little like, um a little like Lemonheads in there, maybe sure. a little Veruca Salt. When I hear you guys song My Body, I, I, I hear little elements too. I'm not sure if it's coincidental, maybe it is, but I'm hearing some some uh, elements of that song too. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, the uh, bands you just named are definitely stuff we play in the van, so. Yeah. Any other thoughts on on that song? I don't know it that well. Okay. <laughs> it's it's a great track. So, I, a kick off to the list. Yeah. I heard I heard I've, I've heard the Bug album a couple of times, but I'm not as what well. you have done more research. Yeah. I'm ashamed. Uh, <laughs> a lot of meat puppets in there, too. I hear a lot of meat puppets. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, not a great group. Um, your next one, track two, is Bacchae in the song Dig. Again, this is from 2018. So actually, what I loved about your list is besides UK subs, we'll talk about next, from the 70s, all your songs are from the 2000, the 2010s. Um, was that intentional, too, when you put this list together? Were you looking for songs that maybe were inspiring you right now more than songs than a Breeders song that you liked when you were growing up or a Sleater Kinney song that you liked? 
Hey, right if now. we have the opportunity for people who might not otherwise have heard bands that we think are really good, we're going to take that opportunity because yeah. people listening have probably heard, you know, Cannonball before. Yeah, so sure. right. uh, <laughs> might as well might as well try to put something out there that's like uh, interesting. And I, I always find that's interesting. That's why we listen to, you know, non-commercial radio because yeah. it's not that you're going to love every song that comes on, but it's the idea of hearing something that you do love that you hadn't heard before. So I think that we like to take that opportunity, and it's not it's not forced. It's literally just stuff that we think is exciting going yeah. on, stuff that we're listening to in our own uh, record collections. It's a cool way for you guys to turn on your fans to a lot of new music too, right? For sure. Um, so with Bacchae, this is a great DC post-punk group. Was that who's, whose uh, selection was that? That was you again. Yeah, I think these are going to be in, in order pretty okay. much. But, uh, <laughs> The, yeah, we just played with them a few days ago for the first time, which is really great because I've been listening to the band for a little while, and uh, I think we're seeing a theme here, but uh, I was going to mention about them that they're in a similar way, and DC has a long, hardcore yeah. punk history, really great bands. Um, there's some new bands that are coming out, newer bands that are you know getting, getting really big out of that scene, band like Turnstile, um, and a lot of those bands are... They, they come across as being very masculine, very he heavy and aggressive. And this band, Bacchae, has been playing with those types of bands in D.C. for years. And it just shows you that the people who show up to these shows, the people who are involved in running these shows, aren't as like uh, singular in their vision as you might expect. And it's also inspiring to see a band, young people, not... Uh, you know, willing to step outside of exactly the format the other bands around them are playing. I went to Cheesecake Factory with a bass player two times. <laughs> two times. <laughs> yeah. Is it good? Yeah. You ever have an avocado egg roll? Uh, not there. It's a I'll little pricey, but yeah. if you go at happy hour, it's half off. Uh, I will definitely check that out. <laughs> yeah, um, cool. I love also that song. It feels like an early B-52 song. Too, For sure. Bit. Like um, Actually, last week, we had Bully, and Alicia from Bully was here doing a similar thing that we were doing here, and she put on um, the B-52's Hero Worship, which is from their first record, and you, it's one of the few B-52 songs where it's just Cindy on lead. You don't have the dual lead vocals of Cindy and Fred. So I heard a little bit of that song. What do you think Fred did? For that track? Yeah, if they played it live. Um, I don't know. Hype man. Yeah. Had a cocktail. Probably, <laughs> I feel like there was a beach ball involved. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, all right, see, next next on the list. Uh, let's pull up the, the full list. Okay. Um, track three. So now we have the UK subs. Is this you again, Jared? Yeah. Okay, so, this, so now we're in the 70s. Yeah. It's the one track on your whole list that goes back to the 70s. This is some early London area punk. Talk about, you chose CID. Talk about that track. Uh, yeah, it, uh, the, their first album kicks off with it. I think it might have even been their first single ever, like a slightly yeah. different version. And... Uh, they're in the first wave of British punk bands and are still around, have continually been a band since 1976 through till now with about as many different members as, yeah. you, as any band could possibly have. And uh, we've been thinking about them a lot recently because we just did our first UK tour in a while and Charlie, who is the one main consistent member of UK Sub since the beginning, is the main songwriter came to a bunch of our shows when we were in the wow. UK, and uh, as soon as he walked through the door the first show, I was like, this guy's got a story. <laughs> you can just tell just by looking at him. And he didn't make it a big deal. He wasn't like, oh, I'm Charlie from the UK subs. He just like was hanging out, talking, and the kind of personality that we meet on tour, and you're like, man, this guy's got some great stories, whatever. And then eventually it came up that he was Charlie from the UK subs. And uh, that song and that album, their first album, uh, uh, in particular uh, is really cool because I think it is at a moment in punk where it's like kind of the attitude and the look of it are, are of a certain thing, but the sound is a little bit more open. A lot yeah. of the bands in 1976 in London didn't all sound the same. Right. Not everybody sounded like a oi, 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 like street punk band or right. something. So I think that uh, UK subs eventually became more of that style, but this album is a little bit more broad. And Charlie was almost 40 by the time the band started, so he had been playing in he's like, like British R&B bands. Yeah, exactly. Like and you can right. hear yeah. that influence in this album, so it's like yeah. a really tough R&B album in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I thought that was really cool. So I've been listening to it a lot since we were hanging out with him and talking to him. So I figured I'd put it on the list. It's also like when you hear those tracks, it, you feel the energy and the the spontaneity of a live show, which I think, especially like on your newest record. 
record all at once, you feel that energy too. It feels, it almost feels like on certain levels I'm, uh, I'm, I'm listening to a live Screaming Females record, so I'm not sure again if that was intentional or not, but the energy that you have in the recording there is captured in that UK subs record too. Yeah, and it was just such a it was just such an honor to have somebody come out to our shows like that who has literally seen more bands than almost anybody in the world. Yeah. You know, you tour for 30 years, 40 years straight with his other bands and yeah. everything included. You just you get, can get just so jaded on music and for somebody to spend his time when he's not on tour to come out and come to multiple shows that we're playing, it just feels like something it feels like some sort of stamp of approval, not just about our band, but our ability to play live, like you were saying. Yeah. Uh, up next, I think, are we going to switch maybe to one of you guys? Uh, Shannon Wright? That's me. That's you. Okay, so now, Marissa, where are you? Shannon Wright, St. Pete. This is from 2007. Um, really cool indie singer-songwriter, little DIY punk aesthetic. Maybe talk about, about why you chose that song. Um, I, I just have been listening to her albums a lot. We saw... I, I've heard her name a bunch of times, and I just never thought to check it out. But um, she played at the Electrical Audio um, like block party they had to oh, celebrate wow. their 25th anniversary or 20th anniversary. 20th anniversary. Yeah, Steve Albini's studio Steve Albini. yeah. in Chicago. Um, so we went and played that, and she played before us. And she's probably the best guitar player I've ever seen. Wow. Um, and she was uh, – so then I was like, wow, I mean, if that was very enjoyable. I should listen to the records. And, and what do you know? Those are all so – quite pleasing so i've just been enjoying them and i chose that song because i like it um, i love that song too and the kind of the minimal instrumentation uh makes me think of your song dirt too a little, a little more minimalist yeah. uh compared to the other songs on that record yeah um her gu her guitar she, she's really cool she does like a lot of finger picking but then the i think the album preceding the one that saint pete is on which of course the title escapes me has is a lot more like guitar oriented yeah. and i think recently she's kind of like um started playing the piano a lot more and yeah. like collaborating with people and i the most lazy comparison is like pj harvey right but um and i love pj harvey yeah. very very much so um but yeah she's i have never seen someone shred so hard <laughs> and so she too not boxing herself in like you guys were talking about before about that freedom to create whatever you feel like is how you want to make your music at that given time. Yeah, I really don't know that much about her history, um, but since I've, since we made records with Steve Albini, I've kept in touch with him, and yeah. I was just like, I think I texted him once, I was like, thank you for making these records, because they're so good, and he was just like, yeah, she's the best guitar player That's ever. That's awesome. Uh, up next, actually, I think m maybe my, my favorite track on the list was No Men, Hell is Real. Is that you also? Yes, that's me. Talk about that band or that song in particular. They're from Chicago, and they jumped on our Chicago show on our last, not our, well, yeah, the last time we played Chicago, um, because a band dropped off, and our friend Peter, who runs Let's For Ten Records out of Bloomington, all come in full yeah. circle yeah. now, uh, he put out their record that that song is on, um, and uh, I, he played them for me while we were driving to Chicago, and I was like, I like this. And then we saw them, and I was like, it's confirmed that I like this yet again. Full circle, it's very much like the Shannon Wright story, yeah. but backwards. <laughs> you see where I'm going I got this? you, I got you. And so I was very pleased yeah. in my mind and my ears, and uh, yeah, I've been listening to that record too. Be it, they also shred. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Yeah, it's really it's very pleasing. It's a great track, and some of the videos I watched some of the music videos too. Really, uh, just no, I haven't watched. Um, it's almost like one of them I saw was like like Suspiria. It was it was cool. Oh, you know, that sounds too scary. Yeah, it, it I, was a that movie scary. made me feel nauseous. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, me too. By the I way, I don't like watching those, too much. his movies. Yeah, um, upsetting. Lemuria, am I pronouncing that right? I don't Lemuria. Okay, I say Lemuria. So this is more tunnel of the next track on your record. This is a Buffalo, New York-based kind of power pop emo band. Like, we call them a prog rock band. Prog rock. Okay, yeah. Was <laughs> no, this no. Also, was this your pick or kind of <laughs> a more? Of a, okay, talk about that song. Uh, we've been friends with Lemuria for a b billion years. They've been a band forever. Uh, a billion is a new number I made. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they used to, they, I mean, they, they're a lot like what Jared was talking about. Um, yeah. I think they kind of started as like a pop punky band and then like have kind of gone in a different direction, playing more like indie rock. And then yeah. we call it our joke that they're a prog rock band because sometimes they play in like weird time signatures and stuff. Um, we went on tour with them with Against Me in 2008, but we'd known them forever yeah. from DIY shows and stuff like that. Um, 
And we just became really good friends. And I, I had seen them multiple times, but I didn't really start to like, kind of love their band until I saw them like 30 times in a row. Wow. And then I was like, yeah, I like it a lot. Um, <laughs> So I've just been following them ever since, and uh, we've we've all stayed in touch. You know, one of my closest friends is neighbors with the singer, and so I see her semi-regularly, and we also go to Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> Get the avocado egg rolls? I actually don't go that often, but yeah, it's it's coming up a lot gotcha. today. <laughs> just a coincidence. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, the, uh, the, the pop punk aspect of them, it's like when I hear your track, um, I'll Make You Sorry, which is a great song from the record, I hear some of the more maybe pop punk elements of on that album i think i hear it more in that track over over other ones yeah for sure i mean we like i was saying when we first started we played a lot of uh punk shows um diy punk shows and at that time it was pretty much um 90 percent of the bands were either a pop punk band or a hardcore band yeah. and we love those those genres and i don't think we've ever been uh afraid to let them influence us so uh yeah i mean i think a lot of people have said that that song is probably the most pop punk style song yeah. that we've put out in quite a while and it wasn't anything that we were consciously trying to do or or afraid of or anything it was just had a riff had a cool idea and went with it that's cool um gland cram it are we still on you marissa nope. okay so now mike what are you hi Hi. <laughs> nice to, to talk to you now. Um, this is a song, uh, like a New Orleans bass band yeah. from a couple years ago. Talk about, about this one. Um, well, I don't know much about their band, but I do think that they rock. Yeah. Um, the Community Records put out the album. They've been a label for 10 years now, Greg and Daniel? <laughs> I don't know. I trust. They've been they've been doing the label for a long time. It, they you know put out started out putting out like ska albums yeah. and stuff, and they put out a whole bunch of really cool eclectic music. And I really admire what they do. So uh, play the glam the glam yeah. track. Brian Funk, who sings in the uh, Baton Rouge doom metal band Thou, sent with a me new album out on Community Records. New album out. <laughs> uh, Good plug. He he sent me the Gland album before it came out and I played it in the van. He said they're the best band in New Orleans. I saw an interview with them. They said that when they perform it live, we daydream of flipping tables, throwing drinks, and being carried out by bouncers while spitting in their faces. That's what that song makes yeah. me feel. Yeah. yeah, it's a really <laughs> badass song. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, up next, uh, my favorite title, song title, is The Pastry Changer by Spouter. Spouter from New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, very inspiring young band. Uh, that's the sleeper hit on the album. There are a few other favorite tracks, but that's uh, that one's got the monster bass line, so I had to go with, with that one. Is this because you like the song so much that you that you're speechless, or I'm so proud of them. Yeah, <laughs> it's from your home. You know, it's from New Brunswick, New Jersey, right? Where you guys are from? Yeah, they live next door to the liquor store called Joe's Liquors King of Kegs. <laughs> and when I got my first credit card, my dad called me and he said, "Can I curse?" Yeah, 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 yeah. You can he curse. Said, it's a rock and roll hall of fame. He thing. said, Maurice, what the fuck's up with this King of Kegs bullshit? Because <laughs> I didn't understand that he would, it would say it on the credit card. So <laughs> I kept, I had just turned 21. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure what a pastry changer is, but, um, <laughs> but I think, I think it's the, the, the delivery guy in the morning who goes and switches out the fresh pastries. So it's just a literal interpretation of yeah. the story. Gotcha. I hear you. Blue um, collar life. <laughs> we, we got two more. Um, this next band, I think you were saying you have a tattoo of this band. We're at uh, Shell Shag with Make Love. I think all you guys are fans of this group, yeah, right? Yeah, great band. They they uh, set up some of our coolest first punk shows in New York. They taught us how to be a band, yeah. how to be compassionate people. They're very, I don't know, also very inspiring. Yeah, they've been around in various bands and projects since the early 90s um, out of uh, San Francisco originally and then making the move to New York City. And they just have this kind of lifer quality to them that's really inspiring to, and to tons of people. Anybody who kind of yeah. comes in contact with them becomes inspired by it. And it's it's just that the, the music is like uh, an... Uh, irrepressible element of their life. You know, it's not something that 
they have to worry about when they're going to practice or write songs, or it's just ingrained and integrated into everything they do. And so they run like a video production studio that they live out of that now is doing really well. And they, you know, all these famous shows have been filmed there and things. And it's just because it enables them to have the space to create with the equipment there and all this stuff. And it's for younger bands when you see that kind of life, you're like, oh, we don't need to be multimillionaires to continue yeah. this life and the creative process for a long time. When I hear your song, uh, End of My Bloodline, kind of that, that drone-like groove you guys have in that song, I, I, I hear a little bit of, of, of that track, too. I can't wait to tell them that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have one more, and thank you guys for going through all this. Really, it's, it is a great list, um, and we're going to be playing it, I think, actually, as you're walking music tonight, if that's cool. So that sounds be, great. Be, you know, be warming up to these songs. Uh, Street Eaters with Means from last year. Tell me more about this song. Another Bay Area band, California. Um, punk Lifers. Uh, John was in the band The Fleshies and Triclops. Megan was in a million bands, <laughs> Play, played drums in a mil and guitar in a million bands. Um, and they, yeah, they just uh, are they're, yeah, they're political they're activists and artists and best friends. And yeah. it's, you know, inspiring. Really, in really involved with like the Gilman Street scene, the, the one of the earliest sustainable all ages wow. venues that bands like Green Day uh, yeah. came out of. And uh, things like Maximum Rock and Roll, which is the longest running punk fanzine in the world. Um, so it's just people who love music and they love still being involved in supporting other bands and just that whole lifestyle, which is like really uh, a big thing in the Bay Area, but it's kind of getting uh, sweeped under the rug and pushed aside as the Bay Area develops into this like tech haven or whatever. I think clearly the there's an underlying theme of support in your playlist. You guys clearly chose these songs with a great intention. You were looking to, to you know, you're, you've developed relationships with, you know, with many of these people. You've been inspired by them. You probably, I'm sure, influenced them as well. It's just, it's a really, I, I dug your approach to how you curated this list. So uh, thank you so much for being here today. For Marissa, for Mike, for Jarrett, Screaming Females, they'll be on the main stage, our PNC stage outside, part of Rock Hall Live. Uh, this was episode seven of Guest Sets. Follow the playlist on Spotify. You can really discover and dig deep into the influences and the music that you guys are listening to right now. Uh, Screaming Females, thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great show tonight. Thank thanks, everybody. You.